Awesome. Look at all those happy faces coming onto the screen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon in some time zones. Yeah, it just depends on where you're at. But we're here in Scottsdale, Arizona, sunny Scottsdale, and we can't wait to share with you some of the disruptive things that we heard from Gary last last week at family reunion lots of great takeaways yeah, very yeah. tangible and very tactical usable information and some of it won't come as a surprise to you but i think once you think through it we have spent a lot of time dissecting all of his slides and we've actually watched his vision speech i've watched it five times now six times if you include live <laughs> um and so we're going to talk about that for like 20 minutes or so and then any questions that you guys have we're happy to answer them towards the end um, so let's get started. So what, what surprised you the most about what Gary said last week, or maybe just was an aha moment for you? Well, first of all, let me just say, I love that he presents the data when he does the vision speech. I find that that information is so helpful in me understanding the bigger picture, all of the different effects that have a, a, an impact on the real estate market, right? It's not just as simple as buyers and sellers. We have to think about things like employment rates and inflation rates. And so for me, that presentation with the data, I love the data, super helpful and understanding in being able to articulate to clients why they should make the moves they should make. So you bring up a great point. Um, and I'm a numbers nerd, as you know. So I spent all last weekend or the weekend before literally dissecting all the data and looking at it. Here's what I thought was fascinating. And if you miss this, go back and look at the, the slides or the vision speech because you'll see it. And because I was looking for what are the patterns? Here was my big, some of my takeaways. This is interesting. Um, what I found fascinating, remember 51% of everybody who started their search for a home, they started online, right? Yeah, that yeah, makes they, sense. They sure did, right. But did they buy from a realtor? Oh, yes. Right. And, and it was a higher percentage than, than in like the last 15 years. 90% of all sellers used a realtor and 87% of all buyers used a realtor, even though they started online, they used their tablets. Uh, they used other resources. They used right. people to open houses. They did all those things. But when it came to buying they, yeah. in the hottest real estate market on the planet, they still used a realtor. But here's the fascinating takeaway that I want you guys to think about. And I'd love to hear what you think the answers are. They used a realtor, but only 13% of the buyers used the realtor that they had purchased from. And only 29% of sellers used the realtors that they had bought from. So over 80% of people are saying that they would use the same realtor again if they had the opportunity, but only 13 and 29 respectively actually did. Right. And, and in, interesting, it was like 75% said, said they definitely would. And 15% said probably. So you're back up at 90. Right, right. Said that they would actually use their previous agent. And we know that they actually used an agent because 90% of them did. Right. But they didn't use the previous one. Interesting. Now, most of us think, oh, well, that's just because they didn't have a touch campaign. Do we, th do we think it's just like sending them a postcard? I think that's a piece of it. And it obviously goes much deeper than that. It goes much deeper than that. And what Gary said was super fascinating. And I didn't hear it the first time. I heard it the second time. And what he said was they let a new relationship get in between them and, the, and, and their previous client. Meaning someone else introduced them to a new relationship, meaning, oh, meet my friend who's a realtor, meet my mom who's a realtor, meet my realtor. Right. And they had a, a stickier relationship with that new relationship than with their old one. Well, we all love repeat and referral business, right? And, and most of the mega teams in Keller Williams get a vast majority, 70 to 90% of their business from repeat and referral business. What we have to remember is there's other agents out there prospecting our database. Exactly. And, and, and Gary brought that up. And then Jason said, so the truth is we probably know all the people that are going to buy and sell. They're already in our database, but the problem is they're also in yours and yours and Zillow's and <laughs> right. right. Everybody else's. So what do we have to do to become so sticky that they will use us the next time that they buy or sell? Like, so we've got to have me a meaningful relationship with them. And that, that, that means more than just sending them a postcard on how to make a, a, a pumpkin pie. Right. More than the occasional email that's automated and not personalized at all. Correct. So it caused us to start thinking about how are we going to create that stickiness, you know, in 47 locations with 175 agents, like how are we going to teach and train them to do that? So mm -hmm. that, that was one piece that I thought was really fascinating. And um, last year in, in our own personal business, 72% of all of ours was repeat and past clients. 
Um, so most teams are doing a better job than single agents at executing on this. Why? Single agents are busy. They don't have anyone doing any of the right, right. Right. So wherever you are in your business, ask yourself, obviously you want that repeat and referral business. The question you're asking yourself is what are you doing intentionally? What is the system you've created to stay in meaningful conversation after the closing such that those clients remain your clients over time and they don't get poached by other people? So I'm just curious as to, you know, what you guys think may be the reason that they said they probably they they definitely or most likely would use their previous realtor and didn't. Do you guys have other ideas as to why that may be other than what Gary suggested? Let me ask you this. How important is it to stay in touch in a meaningful way? Connections. Or maybe they had a bad experience. And that would make up the 10% of people that say, you know what? I'm not even interested in working with the same agent. Sure. And that happens. That does happen. But what it also taught us, so what was disruptive about that conversation is we came away thinking, hey, not only do we want to stay disruptive enough with our with, with how we communicate, connect with our past clients, but we had an idea. What if we could go get other people's businesses? right? Meaning they're going to use a realtor. They, they probably aren't going to use their realtor. So why not use us? So how can we actually get in the middle of someone else's business and, and, and lure business to us that is going to use a realtor, but they're not going to use theirs and create a new relationship with us. So we saw it also as a new opportunity. For sure. For sure. I want to circle back to something you said a moment ago. You said that 51% of people begin the home search online. And again, that makes sense, right? We can sort of understand that. But what I found interesting, Kristen, with the data that was presented was that over the last 10 years, the number of people finding their agent online has been pretty steady between three and 5%, which means a vast, vast, vast majority of people finding their realtors are finding them from friends and family, or they've used them in the past or recommendations. And not many people are using online search engines to find the real estate agents they're actually going to use. Exactly. So that's worth noting. Right. So all of that's worth noting. So here's the thing. If we don't have the systems and models in place to actually make sure we're staying in touch in a meaningful way, in a way that people want to be communicated with, that could happen to any one of us. We could lose our business to someone else who's doing a better job at that. Absolutely. And so staying connected, and this is a shameless plug for our class that we have coming up, but we, we our class that we start March 30th, Scale Your Business to Expand, we mean expand Expand your business, meaning expanding your database. It means growing right where you are. And you're not going to be able to do that without um, a system and a model to stay in touch with those people in a meaningful, in such a meaningful way that no matter what new relationship they get introduced to, they're still going to use you. Absolutely. So that, that was one piece of, of a big takeaway for us. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then also when he talked about inflation, then he talked about you know, the, the, the trend line over the last several years at 4.4%. And he said something really interesting. And that is, if you're going to stay in your house more than 10 years, you shouldn't care what price you're paying for the house because the, four, the trend line, every time within any 10 year period, you can choose any years, it always comes back to the trend. Line. My single favorite slide from all of family reunion was that slide that you're describing right now. So, so let me let me break that down a little bit more. So sure. we all know that in 2005, six, uh, the market was at its peak right before the recession. And what Gary Keller proved just by looking at the normal rates of um, appreciation in real estate versus what we would expect to see was that even if you bought your house in the peak of the market in 2006, after a 10 year period, because of the rate of appreciation, the housing market caught back up and you could not lose money in 10 years. So when I hear people say, geez, I don't want to overspend by $10,000 today. That objection is just an unanswered question because what they don't realize is, well, in one year, the rate at which things are appreciating, you're going to make up that 10,000 and then some. But more importantly, you said you plan on living in this home for at least seven to 10 years, which means it doesn't even matter the market we're in 10 years. Because of the rate of appreciation on that asset, you're going to have equity, you're going to make money. And again, there's, uh, if you missed the vision speech, there was a slide that showed that in black and white. So if, if, if we're bringing up little, little things that I heard the third, the fourth, the fifth time, 
you know, going back and listening to the vision and speech again, because buyers are going to sit down and say, I'm afraid to buy. Right. I'm afraid to pay too much. Right. Um, I, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. Interest rates are going up. And we have to be able to not only explain the market, you know, and be the expert, but show them that, that, that slide, boy, the, if, if you go back and watch the vision speech, just take a picture of that slide because it's super impactful when you can actually show someone there's in the last 50 years, as long as they've been keeping track of this trend line, there's no way you can lose money if you own a home at least 10 years. Right. Now, that obviously means if anybody has an intention of buying and selling a home within 10 years, then we have to be a little bit more tactical with the way that we're pricing it now and understanding that the shifts in the market in the future could have an impact on that. But again, average annual appreciation historically is like 4%. But what do we know about the last four or five years? Right. I mean, 20 or 30% annual appreciation, which is just the change in the housing market year over year in any given market. So I would pose the question to everybody on this call. Do you know the annual appreciation in your market? And can you speak to that with your clients? Yeah. And then just show that the, the, the tracker, the, the slide, it's just super powerful. The slide that he showed right after that, well, not right after that, but in that same speech was about inflation. Yeah. And, and he showed inflation since 1989. And what, what he showed was that um, if you look at the price of a car, you know, it, when you look at the effective rates of inflation, how fast, how fast something went up over time, what was the inflation? Then he looked at it, uh, not only for that, he looked at it for rents. He looked at it for the cost of gasoline. All kinds of things that norm, that, ha that inflation impacts over time to, to articulate basically the cost of the dollar, right. the, the change over time. And what was interesting and fascinating is, and here's the, here's the slide, um, Cars went up 30% since 1989, the price of a car. The price of gasoline has gone up 56% since 1989. The price of a house has gone up 59%. But what about our effective rate of our mortgage, Joe? Mm, down 24%. It's 24% more cost effective to borrow money now than it was in 1989. In 1989. So here's, here's the takeaway. Jason Abrams said it. Buy the, buy the payment, not the price. I love that line. Buy the payment, not the price. If you if you don't remember that slide, it was about, it, the, the title of it was inflation, affordability in perspective. So what Gary's wanting us to see is even though we had inflation, um, when you put it in perspective since 1989, the actual your actual mortgage payment in 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 real dollars is 24% less. Yeah, that's incredible. And we all know that interest rates, rates have been low and have really nowhere to go but up. And so that's another way to talk to buyers about you know, those ones that want to stand on the sidelines. Do you understand the impact 1% increase in, in, in interest has with your spending power? I mean, depending on the price point, we're talking twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in spending power for every 1% appreciation. So Gary, who I think is a pretty doggone smart guy, right? He said, you should, that your, every buyer on your team, a buyer's agent, uh, you know, every agent should have that slide and be prepared to articulate and help people understand that inflation is the best hedge against, or buying real estate is the best hedge against inflation on the planet. Because the rate of real estate appreciation has always outpaced the rate of inflation. And there's actually a slide from Lawrence Yoon, who's the chief economist for National Association of Realtors. And that's for the last 50 years. Inflation has never outpaced the the increase in the average sales price of a home in any given year. So if you know people that have a whole bunch of cash in a checking account, losing money every year because of inflation, their best hedge against losing that money is dumping it into real estate and earning the annual appreciation. And then what did Gary say? He said, you know what you guys should all go do? Remember he opened up his jacket and he said, buy dirt. Buy dirt. Buy real estate. Buy real estate. It continues to be the best investment, obviously, in place to park the money. And so just I think the point that we're trying to make right now, Kristen, is as, as fiduciaries, we have a responsibility to educate and to articulate this information to our buyers and to our sellers. Because again, an objection to not wanting to buy, not wanting to sell is just an unanswered question. They don't understand all of the impact, uh, all the areas of impact at play. And so we can help explain it to them. We're not trying to convince them to do anything they don't want to do. We're giving them the information so they can make a more informed decision. 100%. And you know that when you go through the vision speech and you look at 
where people started to buy, where people, where, when people started to sell a home, you look at all these things and it all comes back to, if we stay connected and super sticky to our database, that's where the gold is. And no one can take that away from you. Right. You know, Zillow can wake up tomorrow and so can Facebook and they can all change their algorithms, which affects us. Right. But as long as we are being sticky with our database, they can't take that away from us. And so that's why I think it's important to understand and be able to articulate to buyers and sellers everything that Gary talked about in the vision speech so that they do see us truly as the experts. And most of the time when you ask people questions and you're able to show them why they might want to consider thinking differently, it's just they don't have the information. Right. It, it changes the conversation from who do you know that wants to buy, sell, or invest in real estate to is it worth 20 minutes of your time for me to help you understand inflation and the impacts of the market and what that looks like over long periods of time so that you can make a strategic financial decision for your family? 100%. Now that's coming from value. That, that is exactly coming from value. And that's why Gary said you need to know this slide so yeah. that you can articulate that. I just want to uh, I mentioned one thing. You, you mentioned repeat and referral business. And of course, we all want the vast majority of our business to come from repeat and referral. Um, as it pertains to referrals, keep in mind that um, inside of KW Command, we have migration patterns. So how about looking at those migration patterns and seeing where people are moving to your city from and reaching out to other Keller Williams agents and starting to build meaningful relationships? I'm not talking about a random spam email saying, refer your business to me. I'm saying picking up the phone and calling that agent and creating a relationship, meeting them at the next family reunion and building out your referral network inside of KW, another great resource. Another great resource. So what questions do you have for us, um, either about the vision speech or um, about anything that, you know, from from um, the family reunion? We've yeah. Got, we've got the data. We can talk pretty much about anything. Like I said, I've watched the speech five times just so I can hear things that I didn't hear the first time. Anything that you heard that you want to clarify or dig into deeper or even just sort of grasp at a deeper level? Uh, the buyer, the percentages of buyers and sellers that went with a different agent. So we think we have that yeah, data. So um, 87% of buyers and 90% of sellers bought with a realtor. However, only 13% of the buyers and only 29% of the sellers bought with their previous realtor. And what percentage of buyers and sellers said that they, they absolutely they would, would have, or probably would have? 90%. 90%. So 90% compared so to 13 and 29. Disconnect. Right. And we're just trying to figure out what's the disconnect so that we can make sure that that we don't have that. The information we're talking about, guys, um, if you log into your family reunion portal, um, it's the vision speech. And, and I'm not sure if the slides are available, but you can absolutely watch the presentation and see the slides as Gary's explaining them. So that would absolutely be worth a couple of hours of your time. And that's what I did. I actually snapped pictures of the presentation along the way. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What other questions do you have? So Josh asked, how can we use this information to get an additional listings? Um, and I'd love to transition to this sure. to this information. Um, that's a great question, yes. Josh. Another thing covered the, uh, during the vision speech was the tenure in previous homes. How long are people staying in their property? And in a nutshell, the way I would summarize this is compared to previous years, more people are actually selling sooner than ever before. We have 8% of people are selling within one year of buying, which is double what it's ever been in the last 10 years. We have 16% of people selling within two to three years. And so we're talking about 25% of homeowners are buying and selling within a three-year period. So that's just a reminder, Kristen, when we sell somebody a house, it doesn't mean they're no good to us for the next seven to 10 years, because statistically, more and more people are selling faster. They are selling faster. And also Gary brought up that I believe it was 47% of agents talked about commission during their sit down at the kitchen table when they were listing the home. And he said, the reason that they did is they brought up um, competitive pricing, menu of services. And actually when, when the seller had an objection about commission, he, they said, you know what, here's a menu of services you choose you get to pick the commission. When not that fun? So he said the people that actually have a menu of services 
um, actually end up with a higher average commission than the average commission rate, which this year was 2.6%, mm. that they end up with a higher amount by offering a menu of services because typically people pick the menu or the, the item or the percentage that has the value in the services that they want. Right, right, right. And I think uh, I'm making up stats now here, but it, I think most people choose like the middle option, right? right? So if you had a five, a six and a 7% as an example, right. I think statistically, most people are going with 6%. So he just said, you know, offer a menu of services. That's that that is um, not that is a compelling reason um, that that sellers will want to use you because you offered them choice. The other thing that was fascinating. Do you remember um, what what the typical number of agents that a seller uh, interviews before he chooses his his listing agent? Oh, I'm trying to remember the exact number. I don't want to get it wrong. Well, what was interesting is that the super majority of people choose their first agent. Yeah, it's something like seven. Uh, again, I'm I'm hesitant to make up numbers. I'm finding I it. think we have it in yeah. here. Um, I think it's something like eighty-seven percent, something like that. Actually, you between the two, um, and 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 we'll get the exact numbers in just a second. We have it. Um, we have it here. But here's the point: be the first at the be table. The first. Get to the table. And this is true for buyers and sellers. Even if somebody says they're going to sell in a year from now, why not go on a listing presentation now and say, hey, look, why don't I give you a couple of bullet points on things you can do to prepare yourself for selling in one year from now? And oh, by the way, how often is a seller's timeline accurate with when they're going to sell? You can, that's all right. You can say, you can say never. It's never accurate, right? And that's not because they're lying. It's because things change, things evolve. And so the point there is get to the table fast, get that contract signed fast and start working with them to prepare for listing, even if they're not ready to go today. Exactly. So 82% chose the first agent that they met with, 10% chose the second agent. So we're talking 92% of people that use an agent picked their first or second. 82%, that's more than four out of five, picked the very first person they met with. Well, how about when they were interviewing agents to represent them as a buyer? What did that look like? 73% chose the first agent, 16% the second agent. So, so that's again, 91%. Speed, so Gary said speed to the lead. Speed to the lead. Nine out of 10 deals are being closed with the first agent they met with. Right. So if you get a call on a Sunday that somebody wants to meet with you to sell their home, um, my first question is going to be, are you, are you interviewing other agents? And if they say yes... I I would ask when when's the first appointment? Right. Would you prefer two p.m. today or four p.m. today? <laughs> would you like me to come right now? <laughs> right, right, right. Speed to the lead is super important. Um, I thought I found those statistics fascinating, um, and I think you brought up another thing when we were re reviewing the data, and that was that for sale by owners went down this year, and and in the hottest real estate market on the planet. Right. And that's interesting to think about because I think people are starting, starting to figure out they don't want to deal with it. They don't have the professional acumen, tools, resources that we do, and they mostly just don't want the hassle. And so, hey, why not continue to approach those FISBOs? I think it's something like 80% of FISBOs that list as a FISBO end up selling with a real estate agent. We had one example of a, of a guy that listed, uh, they were way overpriced. Uh, our agent took the listing, put them at the right spot, um, and sold the house within, within, I think it was within three days or something. Um, so don't rule out FISBOs even in this crazy market. Absolutely. So what questions do you guys have that we can answer for you um, that came out of the data or just anything at all? I think we cover everything in the chat box, but if we missed your question in the chat box, go ahead and retype it. I want to make sure I'm going through the long list. Um, or any other questions for that matter around this data or around anything from Film Reunion? Yeah, we have three or four minutes left. Happy to answer your questions. While you're typing, let me just say this. Hopefully, if nothing else, today's presentation is showing you how important the data is. I know that we all don't love the numbers and we all don't love reading and interpreting data, but the data tells a story that then dictates our strategy. Exactly. So we have to be willing to read and interpret the data so that we can have a better approach to getting more business, to take our unfair share. So our strategy boiled down to two things. Make sure that we are um, um, touching, communicating, um, and being responsive to our database and increasing our referrals, um, but the same way. Absolutely. Uh, we have actually one agent on our team that calls five agents a day. Um, just to remind them who he is, where he sells real estate, and just staying in relationship with them. So that maybe that's not new, but when you look at the data, it becomes so compelling because if you don't do it, someone else is going to take that, that's that right. mind share away from you, and they're going to get into relationship with them, and that's why you lose them. That's right. It's not because they they weren't going to use you. They said they would. Right. 
but we let somebody else. It's not personal. It's it's the way that it happens, Mm -hmm. but we we can prevent it. So Lynn asked a question, Kristen. Um, She has to give an overview of the class. Uh, I I believe she's referring to the Scale scale. Your Business that's coming up. Maybe a quick overview. So what the Scale Your Business to Expand class does is it helps you build the systems and the models inside of your company and actually document them and making sure that you have, have it ready to actually grow. Because oftentimes agents grow and they don't have the systems to, they don't have the capacity to actually uh, manage that growth. So we teach you how to be proactive, how to, um, gr- you know, how to manage your database, how to touch it, how to actually set it all up um, so that you can expand into another location or just expand your business where you are. What are those systems? What do those playbooks look like? What does the model look like? What does your, um, your org chart look like? Your right. vision map, your right. culture? Um, how do you filter opportunities that come your way? We cover all of that it's, in eight weeks. It's basically a business class. It's a business class. Right? Mm-hmm. Using business fundamentals to take a look at how it works in real estate. Exactly. And like you said, it's eight weeks long. So what I what I personally love about this class is it's one hour a week over eight weeks. We're going to give you very specific action items each week. So instead of just going to a class, taking notes and putting them in a drawer, every week you're actually going out there and taking action, making decisions and making changes in your business, coming back the following week for another piece of the puzzle. And we build that over eight weeks. Um, there's a link in the chat box if you want to um, get more information about that class. Yeah. And, you know, if if you need more information, there's information there and we'll be happy to answer your questions. But most people um, try to build, it's kind of like trying to fly an airplane and and repair it at the same time. Right. We use the analogy of duct taping it while you're flying it. Right, right. Don't do that. Let's build the plane first (laughs) and get it fixed so that we can have a smooth flight. So if we can help you in any way, I'm a, a MAPS group coach. Um, master faculty with Keller Williams, and we want to help you grow your business. And we want you to have the right foundation to do it. Absolutely. Why don't we end the day? We've only got about a minute and a half left. Uh, Two or three um, ahas. What did we hear today? I know we went really fast. We wanted to pack in as much as we could in 30 minutes. What did you hear today that's actionable? Whether you knew it or not, or heard it for the first time, what can you go take action on uh, in your real estate strategy that you heard today? Use a chat box, or let's have even a couple of people come off mute. Let's hear, uh, let's hear from a couple of people. I love action items. Just- Jonathan said in the chat box, calling other agents and, and talking to them about what you, what, where you work, who you service, et cetera. Leon said, staying in meaningful conversation. Allison loved the idea of menu of services, flexible commissions. Does anybody want to come off mute and share perhaps? Hi, it's Margaret. Can you hear me? Yeah, Margaret, go ahead. I I actually have a question. Um, As a busy agent, it's hard to be first in the door all the time. And apparently, according to the stats, the sellers or the buyers don't know the difference between a seasoned agent or a more productive agent versus the first agent they meet. So in this market, how the heck do you address that? It's like you're either busy doing your work. You're not out walking around wandering meeting people. Do you know, I think that's also why we have systems and models so that we do have the time to make sure that we can, because when somebody calls that, you know, I hear it all the time. I was on, I was actually talking to a gentleman in Tennessee this morning and he said, nobody, none of the agents will answer their phone. I think we have to answer our phones. It's, it blows my mind sometimes how true that is. Um, The other thing I would just add to that, Kristen, is when we think about our own SOI, we think about all the time in between their transaction and the way we're communicating with them. I know we've already talked about this today, but are you doing a needs analysis and are you asking them meaningful questions about what their future real estate needs are? And again, having the conversation about an appointment before they've even decided they're ready to buy or sell in in some cases, or sometimes six to 12 months before they think they're ready to go. So instead of hearing, call me back in six months, great. Well, what if instead of calling you back in six months, we schedule an appointment next week and I talk to you about what you can do over the next six months to prepare to buy or sell so that you're ready to go. Or That's to buy a way, an investment property. Or, or to do something else, exactly. So I think just getting into the table uh, as quickly as possible. And then like Kristen said, if they are actually interested in meeting, then responding within a timely manner and setting that appointment within a timely manner. And when you set the appointment, be first. A lot of times we don't even think about it. We just look at our calendar and say when we're available. And the point is figure out if they have appointments with anyone else. And if so, get there before them. Set your appointment before them. Yeah. Lynn had an awesome takeaway. Add the inflation slide to the buyer consultation, the 10-year conversion. I couldn't agree more, Lynn. And in fact, I think Gary even said during the presentation a couple of times, this is the data we should be sharing with our buyers and sellers. 
So I love the idea of adding it right into your presentation. Love that. Well, I think that's time, Kristen. Okay. I flew right by. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, today. And um, we hope that you've gotten a couple of nuggets out of this to go have a great 2022. If we can be of help, let us know. You can find us um, by going to the KristenColeNetwork.com. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks all. Thank you.